The Soviet BI glides midair, its wooden metal frame gleaming under the overcast sky. In the cockpit, pilot Grigory Bakchevanji grips the controls. He's already taken this experimental warbird once before on its maiden flight. Now, it's time to push it to its limits. The rocket engine propels the BI forward with a force that slams Bakchevanji back into his seat, shooting faster than even the Luftwaffe's best could dream of. Bakchevanji feels the raw power of the aircraft as it slices through the air. The engine devours its precious fuel reserves at an alarming rate. Less than a minute since takeoff, and half the tank is already gone. Suddenly, the BI begins to tremble, its airframe vibrating with an intensity that might shake the plane apart. Years of Soviet innovation and sacrifice are on the verge of collapse as the BI's nose starts to dip, the ground below looming closer. Bakchevanzi fights the yoke, but the plane defies his every command, just as it edges into transonic speed territory. Karlev's Vision Long before Hitler's rocket-powered Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet took to the skies, aerospace engineers across the globe raced to unlock the potential of high-speed flight. In the Soviet Union, this quest found its champion in Sergei Korolev, whose early 1930s vision of stratospheric warbirds would become the foundation of Soviet rocket aircraft development. Korolev's experiments with rocket engines led him to adapt one of his earlier creations, the SK-9 glider, into a flying laboratory that could test the boundaries of rocket propulsion. This transformation gave rise to the Soviet Union's first rocket-powered aircraft. Originally christened Object 218, it was later renamed RP-318 as developments advanced. Yet, just as production of the plane was taking off, Korolev's trajectory led to an unexpected crash. As the Soviet Union descended into the turmoil of Stalin's Great Purge, Korolev found himself ensnared in the regime's crossfire. Accusations of disloyalty and sabotage, a fatal sentence in those years, were fabricated against him by colleagues coerced under brutal interrogations. Declared a saboteur of military technology, Korolev was imprisoned and subjected to the unforgiving conditions of forced labor in Siberia's Kalima camps at a time when the storm clouds of Nazi Germany's rise loomed over Europe. Hitler's Luftwaffe gained strength by the day, and Stalin's regime recognized that air superiority would be the key to keeping his nation afloat in the upcoming years. Despite condemning the very pioneer who dared to lead the charge in rocket aircraft engineering, Karlev's bold vision refused to disappear. The race for rocket aircraft begins. On February 28, 1940, the RP-318 attempted its first powered flight with test pilot VP Fedorov in the cockpit. The pilot began its journey tethered to a conventional aircraft, which towed it to an altitude of 8,530 feet over the Soviet landscape. Then, with a sudden release, the RP-318 was cast into the open sky, free-falling for an instant before it assumed a smooth glide at a speed of 50 miles per hour. But this serene sail was barely a prelude to the true test, the ignition of its experimental rocket engine. Fedorov braced himself and initiated the start sequence. For a tense moment, the cockpit was eerily silent as the engineers on the ground held their breath. Then came a powerful roar as the rocket engine fired to life and the RP-318 leapt forward. Its speed surged to 87 miles per hour, propelling the aircraft to a new altitude of 9,514 feet as it cut through the crisp air like an arrow. Below, the gathered engineers and officials gazed upward, squinting as the RP-318 disappeared into the clouds, leaving behind a faint trail. This was proof that Karlev's radical vision for the future of aviation could become a reality. That spring, the Central Institute of Aerodynamics, also known as TSAGI, convened a conference, summoning the Soviet Union's brightest minds in aircraft design to address the technology that could catapult the nation into the era of rocket-powered flight. The air was charged with anticipation as engineers, scientists, and military officials debated the possibilities of rocket propulsion in aviation. Amid these discussions, one undeniable truth emerged. Any aircraft equipped with a rocket engine would be bound for flying interception missions due to its voracious appetite for fuel. Consuming up to 11 pounds of fuel per second on average, these planes would be limited to ultra-short flights. Yet, despite this critical limitation, the potential of such a weapon was impossible to ignore. 
for those precious minutes in the air, these planes would soar at blistering speeds, executing maneuvers that would leave enemy aircraft helplessly outmatched. A single engagement would be enough to devastate an adversary before the interceptor could safely return to base, untouched by enemy fire. By July 1940, official specifications for a rocket-powered interceptor were issued, setting the stage for a stratospheric aircraft. The era of rocket-propelled aviation had begun. Project G Among the notable figures at the TSAGI conference was Viktor Fedorovich Bolkovitinov, the head of Soviet aircraft manufacturer OKB-293 and a renowned figure in high-speed aviation. Recognizing the gravity of the task, Bolkovitinov brought with him two of his most brilliant engineers, Alexander Berezhniak and Alexei Isayev. These men, already seasoned in the realm of cutting-edge aircraft design, found themselves drawn to the challenge of creating the fastest plane the Soviet Union had ever envisioned. As Hitler's forces swept across Europe, Bolkovitinov and his team began crafting what would come to be known as Project G. The design was, at first, deceptively simple. A rudimentary aircraft built largely from plywood, weighing around 3,000 pounds at takeoff. Its true innovation lay not in the materials, but in the technology that would drive it, a revolutionary creation being developed at the Reactive Scientific Research Institute, or RNII. This engine, the D-1A 1100, was the brainchild of Leonid Dushkin, the same rocket engineer who had powered Korolev's RP-318. The engine promised almost mythical climbing capabilities, designed to propel the aircraft at blistering speeds and altitudes unmatched by anything the Soviets had fielded before. Yet, delivering on these promises proved infuriatingly elusive. Early tests revealed a troubling lack of thrust, and despite relentless efforts, nearly a year passed without any meaningful breakthroughs. By the summer of 1941, the situation had reached a critical state. With time running out, the engineers decided to take a gamble, experimenting with compressed air instead of traditional pumps to force propellant into the engine. This radical departure from established designs infuriated Dushkin, who viewed it as a reckless compromise. But the engineers had little choice. Desperation replaced caution as the Germans set their gaze toward the Soviet Union. In June 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, a brutal betrayal of the non-aggression pact signed years earlier between Germany and the Soviet Union. Over three million German troops poured across the Soviet border in the largest invasion campaign the world had ever seen. As the Luftwaffe tore through the skies, obliterating the Red Air Force, completing Project G became more urgent than ever. Facing this dire reality, Bolkovitinov and his team submitted an official application to the Kremlin, accompanied by a letter co-signed by the head of RNII, Andrei Kostikov, outlining the potential of the rocket interceptor. The urgency of the situation bypassed bureaucratic delays. After presenting their case in the Kremlin, the project was swiftly approved and shown to Stalin, receiving the green light, despite its obvious vulnerabilities. Suddenly, Project G, with all its unfinished blueprints and unanswered questions, became the Soviet Union's last hope to reclaim a semblance of air superiority against the German invasion. Every minute counts. Bolkovitinov and his team of engineers were thrust into a race against time, given just 35 days to complete their groundbreaking design, now officially designated as the BI, short for Blizhnaya Istribitil, meaning close-range fighter in Russian. Every minute counted. German forces were advancing by the hour, forcing the Soviet Union to frantically evacuate factories, dismantle machinery, and relocate entire production lines to the east in a desperate attempt to keep vital industries out of the enemy's grasp. Amid this upheaval, Bolkovitinov's team scrambled to deliver a fighter unlike any other. The BI measured 21 feet in length with a 21-foot wingspan breaking the traditional designs and appearing more like a sleek, experimental weapon than a hardened warplane. The aircraft's offensive power came from its twin 20mm SHVAK cannons, promising devastating firepower if the design proved successful. Adhering to Soviet wartime constraints, the BI was constructed almost entirely of wood. In their quest to bring his plane to life, Bolkovitinov enlisted furniture workers to craft the aircraft's wooden body. 
working around the clock in dimly lit workshops. They hammered, shaped, and sanded the components of the plane, pushing their carpentry skills to the limits. Failure was simply not an option. By September 1941, the aircraft's engine was still unfinished, but the engineers were unwilling to lose momentum. They began gliding tests to evaluate the plane's aerodynamic properties. On September 10th, test pilot Boris Kudrin climbed into the cockpit of the BI, which was towed aloft by a Petlyakov PE-2 bomber. From the ground, the engineers watched with a mix of anxiety and exhilaration as the tow cable was released. The BI soared through the air, gliding unpowered but stable, a vision of what could be achieved with rocket propulsion. The success of this initial test offered a glimmer of hope. For a fleeting moment, the team dared to believe they were steering the project in the right direction. But there was little time for celebration. By mid-October, the relentless German advance forced the entire BI project to relocate to the outskirts of Sverdlovsk. The new location, a half-finished factory, offered few resources or shelter. Engineers toiled in freezing temperatures, battling the elements as much as they battled the technical challenges of their design. The BI takes off. At their new makeshift facility near a frozen lake, the BI team constructed a test stand, complete with a dynamometer cradle to secure the aircraft during engine trials. The volatile nitric acid used in the engine added an extra layer of danger. Highly corrosive, it posed a constant threat of severe skin burns, respiratory complications, and catastrophic damage to the aircraft itself. In February 1942, the fears of the engineers materialized. During a system test, the engine violently exploded, slamming against the pilot's seat and rupturing a fuel line. Nitric acid sprayed across one of the engineers. Reacting swiftly, his comrades dunked him headfirst into a tank of soda solution to neutralize the acid. The glasses on his face were the only thing that saved him from permanent blindness. This incident prompted urgent revisions to safety protocols. The engineers installed a 5.5 mm steel plate, a barrier designed to shield from explosions or flying debris stemming from a failing engine located right behind the pilot's seat. Despite these setbacks, fortune shifted in the team's favor, as the Soviet winter stalled the German advance, buying valuable time. By May 1942, the D-1A engine was finally installed into a B-1 prototype, and the stage was set for the aircraft's first official powered test flight. On May 15th, test pilot Grigory Bakchevanji climbed into the cockpit for a moment years in the making. The BI came to life, and as the rocket engine ignited, it catapulted into the sky with a surge of speed and power that left the ground crew in awe. The aircraft soared to an altitude of 2,760 feet, reaching a maximum speed of 250 miles per hour, a milestone feat for Soviet aviation. However, the exhilaration was short-lived. After just one minute, the engine began to overheat, forcing Bakchevanji to shut it down prematurely. The B-1 instantly lost power, transforming the once thrilling ascent into a precarious descent. Without adequate propulsion to stabilize the approach, the plane's descent was alarmingly fast. Bakchevanji fought to control the aircraft as it hurtled toward the ground. While the flaps slowed its descent slightly, the landing was brutal, with the impact shattering the landing gear. The entire flight had lasted just three minutes and nine seconds. Yet, even after a crash, Bakchevanji emerged from the wreckage unscathed and full of praise for the B-1. Reflecting on his brief flight, he remarked, quote, In comparison with conventional types of aircraft, the B-1 is extremely pleasant. There's no propeller or engine in front of the pilot, and thus no noise, and no exhaust gases enter the cockpit. In terms of ease of control, too, the aircraft is superior to contemporary fighters. Tragedy strikes. Acid from the rocket engine corroded critical components of the BI-1 prototype, forcing the team to abandon the aircraft and redirect their efforts toward developing the BI-2 prototype. Progress was slow and fraught with challenges. The corrosive properties of the nitric acid posed a constant risk to the engineers, with every adjustment carrying the potential for serious injury. As a result, no further flights were attempted that year. Still, the team pressed forward, refining their designs and producing additional prototypes. By early 1943, the project appeared to be nearing operational viability. 
In test flights, the BI-3 prototype demonstrated remarkable performance for its time, achieving full engine thrust of 10.79 kilonewtons, reaching a top speed of 419 miles per hour, and climbing to a maximum altitude of 13,000 feet. However, significant issues remained. The rocket engine consumed fuel at an alarming rate, depleting its reserves in approximately 60 seconds, leaving little room for error during testing. On March 27, 1943, Bakhtrivanji undertook another test flight. The mission was simple in concept, but dangerous in execution. Determine the aircraft's maximum speed by flying at low altitude until the fuel was exhausted. As the rocket-propelled BI shot through the sky, it achieved an estimated speed between 500 and 560 miles per hour, approaching the edge of transonic range, a milestone for Soviet aerospace engineering. Then, without warning, the aircraft pitched into a 45-degree dive. Whether due to structural instability, aerodynamic forces, or a failure in pitch controls, Buck Javanji found himself in an irrecoverable situation. The BI plummeted toward the ground, crashing with devastating force and claiming the life of its brave pilot instantly. In the aftermath, investigators proposed several theories to explain the crash, but the most widely accepted pointed to a transonic effect that destabilized the plane's pitch controls. Engineers attempted to carry the program forward. Two additional test flights took place years later using the BI-7 prototype, but the project lost momentum. The catastrophic crash of 1943 had effectively marked the end of the Soviet Union's ambitious race to develop a rocket-powered interceptor. The End of an Era Unlike the German Me-163 Comet, the Soviet BI would never reach full operational status. In total, only nine BI prototypes were produced before the program was discontinued. Yet the efforts poured into this ambitious project were far from wasted. The engineers who had toiled under immense pressure and danger to create the BI went on to shape the future of aviation and space exploration, becoming key figures in the Soviet rocket and space race that followed the war. By the mid-1940s, the emergence of turbojet technology rendered the development of rocket-propelled aircraft increasingly obsolete. Turbojets offered impressive speeds without the inherent dangers of corrosive acid fuels, making them a more practical and sustainable solution. The Soviet Union's first turbojet-powered aircraft, the Lyulka TR-1, soared into the skies just a few years after the war ended, marking a new chapter in the nation's aeronautical history. <laughs>